Okay, good morning, everybody. Look at that. Uh, Lily perks up and puts a big smile on. <laughs> <laughs> but good morning. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with Hernando County Extension. And I'm here today with my regular co-host, Lily Brownie, who's sitting up straight and a big smile yeah. on her face. Who knows when the camera starts? <laughs> Already? Yeah, point the camera, move it just right. And welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. Um, if anybody has any questions, as always, just go ahead and put them in the comments. However, you may be watching us because this is broadcast live on our Facebook page. It's broadcast on YouTube live. And it's also broadcast to our face, our private Facebook gardening group. So no matter however you're watching it, if you go down to the comments below and put in a question, comment, we'll see it and we'll share it and we'll go ahead and answer it. If you have pictures or a very specific question you'd like to email to me, um, let me go ahead and put my email up there. Go ahead and shoot me an email. I have my email open right now, so I can go ahead and open it up and read your questions, show the pictures, and that way everybody can learn from whatever your issue may be. And yes. I actually have one picture I'm going to show in a little bit here. Somebody sent me the other day. And I have a picture I'm working on trying to send you. So I'm not actually ignoring you. I'm trying okay, to, okay. to okay. email you the, the uh, picture. I do the same thing. I'll, I'll be teaching an online class and people will ask me a question. I look like I'm like not listening or drifting off or whatever. It's like, <laughs> I'm doing six other things here. Hold on a second. But since I got it queued up, let me go ahead and show you this question from the other day. And this is from Nancy, who I think is one of our regular viewers. I have no idea if Nancy's tuning in right now or not, but she sent me a picture uh, and she was asking, is this a friend or foe? And she said she found a couple of them on her plumbago, where if you're not familiar with plumbagos, it's a small to medium sized flowering shrub and gets blue flowers on it. There's not many things that have blue flowers. So plum, if you want blue flowers, you're going to have to go with plumbagos pretty much. And plumbagos are generally very pest and disease free. I, I never get calls or emails with pictures of what's wrong with it because they are um, very hardy and they generally, they grow, they flower, they grow, they flower. You have to trim them back some to keep them in balance. And other than that, they pretty much take care of themselves. Yeah, they're nice. They're a nice shrub. Mm -hmm. They are, you know, uh, very, very um, carefree and low maintenance. But let me go ahead and show you the picture she sent me. And that is a caterpillar. Mm -hmm. That's a fuzzy caterpillar. A lot of people will call it a woolly bear, although woolly bear, technically traditional woolly bears are orange and black striped. This one has, if we were able to turn him around or have him curl up in a ball, you would see that he probably has red stripes on him. And this is a very um, common caterpillar here. Let me go ahead and show what it is. I knew it was a woolly something. And I saw one at a friend's um, native nursery on Sunday as well. They're very common. And you'll find them feeding on a lot of different plants in your yard and a lot of times weeds. I've seen them a number of times on just a random weed alongside of the road. So they feed on a lot of different things. But the common name for them is going to, for the caterpillar, woolly bear is appropriate. You can call it a woolly bear caterpillar, but it's going to turn into a um, giant leopard moth. And this is a picture of the moth here. And they get about an, about inch, inch and a half long. They're not really, really huge. They look a little bit bigger from the picture here. Very, very pretty moth, very, very common. Um, here's one of the early instar um, caterpillars, and then here's a larger one, just like we saw in the picture. And if they turn or curl up, you can see those kind of 
reddish orange stripes on them. So very, very, and here are all the different plants that they are happy to feed on. Do they so sting they, you? No, these guys are safe. So you always want to be careful with caterpillars that have sharp hairs on them because some of them can sting you. Mm -hmm. Woolly bear caterpillars are friendly. They don't sting you. But if you don't know if they're going to sting you or not, you want to be careful because the ones that can sting you hurt really, really bad from what I've been told. It's probably better for the caterpillar that you don't touch it anyway. So, you know, for both of you, just... It's, they don't really want to be manhandled, so... <laughs> <laughs> but here's a whole list of all the different plants that they'll feed on. Gosh, they feed on cabbage, all different varieties of citrus, uh, sunflowers, a couple different sunflowers, magnolias, bananas, avocados, cherries, black locust, dandelions, violets. So they feed on a lot of different plants. And there's a number of other ones that they don't really feed a lot on. They'll just chew or take a taste of it. So they eat a leaf or two or three and then move on. Mm -hmm. So they're not a pest. No, I would not. I've never seen them be a pest. I've never seen them defoliate or seriously damage a plant. They're one of those things that's out there that you really don't have to worry much about. Great. Another perfect example of that is a Katie did. did do you she? know what a Katie did is? I don't know what did Katie do. <laughs> <laughs> Katie did is a very large insect that looks like a grasshopper because it's in the same order. They're very closely related to grasshoppers and crickets. And you could walk outside one day and see a great big one sitting on your hibiscus and it will eat half a leaf and then fly away. They never stick around to eat a lot of leaves or damage your plant. So if you see one, they're very, very large. They're a couple inches long and they don't hurt you. They don't bite. They're you can kind of if you poke at it, they'll fly away and leave, and they won't eat any more to leave. But they cause so little damage that no control is necessary or advised. Well, I tried to send you, I emailed you, um, it came through my Facebook inbox. So it was sent to you as a link. So hopefully you can open it, <laughs> speaking of caterpillars, um, okay. to be able to see it. And first... Um, I didn't see, you know, there weren't any photos attached. She just said um, that there was a caterpillar on her orange tree. So I asked her to send photos. But what I was thinking before I even saw the photos, you know, I thought I had the answer, but I thought, well, this is odd because we haven't had this question in probably a good 10 years. And the reason is because people just don't have that much citrus anymore. But it turns out it was what I thought it was. Let's see if you can are able to open it. Don't okay. Well, I'll get that in a second. But okay. Diana says the woolly bear caterpillar, they call them willy worms. And I think the one you just sent me has a pretty cool common name also. Mm -hmm. if yes. it's not, I think it is. Yeah. And, yeah, the woolly bear ones do turn into a very, very pretty moth. And like I said, they're very common, especially this time of year, late summer. Willy Worm reminds me of that um, that game we had as kids, you know, with the magnetic thing you were make like Willie's hair, you know, looked all <laughs> woolly just like that. <laughs> yeah. And Nancy, who sent me the picture of the, the Willy Worm or Woolly Bear Caterpillar is on here today. Mm -hmm. And she said she didn't have any of those other plants. And these caterpillars didn't really do any damage to the plumbago. I'm sure they ate a few leaves, but not enough where it's, it's damaging the plant yeah. and causing it, you know, major problems or anything. So if you give me a second here. Okay. Hopefully, you can open it that way. Otherwise, we'll just describe it. <laughs> <laughs> this should be it. There we go. That's it. Yeah. There we go. Believe it or not, that is a caterpillar. Yes, it is. And if you get close to them or touch them, they have these little antennae that they pop out. 
and they'll they'll spit and they'll spray you also with the noxious fluid so they really don't want to be messed with and they'll do everything they can to scare you away mm -hmm. and the common name for that is a bird poop caterpillar because what does it look like lily it looks like bird poop yes it does yes it looks like bird poop name, the other common name is orange dog mm -hmm. the nicer one i guess doesn't look like an orange dog but maybe they just maybe because they feel like it, it guards the orange tree with the way that it <laughs> reacts they do like citrus um so that's why as soon as she said it was on her citrus or on her orange tree is what she said i thought well that's probably the orange dog or the bird poop caterpillar but like it's probably been a good decade since anyone asked about this simply because people just don't have citrus trees that much anymore so is this guy a problem, Dr. Lester? Yes and no. If you have these on a citrus tree, they do eat the leaves, but they don't eat many leaves. And if you have an otherwise mature, healthy citrus tree, you can spare a couple leaves. So you could leave them go, especially if you only have one or two. If you have a lot of them and they start eating a lot of leaves, you may need to thin the population a little bit, but we don't want to encourage people to just get rid of these caterpillars like a lot of other pest caterpillars. I know. Because they turn into the giant swallowtail. Yes. And if you all give me a moment or two, I'll go ahead and try to pull up a picture of... Uh, I'm going to try to send that to you too. So. Okay. Um, well, here, let me look on here. All right. It's pretty easy to pull up a picture. It's going to turn into an absolutely gorgeous butterfly. So what would be... It is. So we, so if you do have these, if you have any kind of butterfly garden, or if you have any interest at all in butterflies or attracting butterflies to your yard, and you have a citrus tree, and you have these caterpillars, you should be very, very happy because it's there's a very, very good chance that now you're going to get these adult butterflies, you know, when the caterpillar uh, matures and turns into a butterfly. Mm -hmm. So here's what a giant swallowtail looks like. Very large, very pretty butterfly. Yes. And then that's what the caterpillar looks like. And, and so it why mimics, does it look like, you know, why, what do you, if people think about it, why does it look like a piece of bird poop? It's for protection. That's right. Who wants because to eat the bird poop? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Not many birds are going to try to eat you if you, number one, look like bird poop. Number two, you have little horns that you can stick out. Number three, you have a stinky material that you can spray on a bird or a lizard or any other animal out there that's thinking about maybe eating you. So it's, it is a really good defense strategy. Yep. It works well. Yep. So we're kind of piling up on questions. Yeah, we got here. lots of questions here. Yeah. Sharon says, I have a couple fruit trees in my yard. Should I dig the lawn out around the trunks? If I do dig it out, should I use mulch? Yes, and maybe. So anytime you put a tree, a plant, a hibiscus, a rose, anything like that in a lawn area, you want to dig out a fairly decent sized circle to plant it in. I see a lot of people will go out there and put a little fruit tree or something in their yard and the grass grows back up against the trunk. And then what are what is your husband or the lawn service tempted to do with that weed eater? Yeah, then you have weed eater blight. Yes, they're going to they're gonna get too close with the weed eater and they're going to damage the bark and damage it that way. So it's a really good idea to have an area of dirt around it. Now, if this is a citrus tree, it's best to leave it just bare dirt. But any other kind of fruit tree, you could put down mulch. And Lily, how much mulch do you want to put down? Oh, no more than two to three inches. Maybe Doesn't even it less work better when you pile it about three feet deep up against the trunk? No, if you want to kill your tree, that's a great way to do it. 
because you'll deprive it of the roots of oxygen and you will hold in fungus and other issues, or you may have, uh, it may act as an umbrella and just shed the water right off the top of that mound of uh, mulch and not let the tree get anything. And it wastes money on the mulch. And I also heard recently somebody pointed out that, especially during the winter, it could become a home for mice and rats. Yeah. It's something if I haven't really thought fruit, about. If you don't pick up the fruit, that could happen regardless. So why aren't we putting mulch around the citrus tree? Because citrus trees are very susceptible to a uh, certain fungus that causes trunk rot. So if you put mulch and it gets up right next to the trunk, touching the trunk, it can cause that trunk rot and now your citrus tree is going to rot and it's going to fall over at ground level. One thing you can try to put around it though that we've been hearing about lately and this is just like an experimental thing is uh, compost. You know a light compost um, application has found um, it's been promising you know it's showing some promise that it helps curb citrus greening it doesn't stop it but it helps the the uh, citrus actually grow it's still green but it's big enough to at least be sweet and make juice out of compost is good for everything basically if you're looking for a silver bullet it's as close as you're going to get to a cure-all for most problems that you might have the other thing i heard about mulch and citrus over the years is that um um, if we're going to have a really cold night, you don't want that radiant heat from the ground blocked. You wanted to try and help it, you know, keep the citrus tree, hopefully, you know, somewhat above freezing. So that's true. Because mm -hmm. our ground is not going to get uh, much below 48, really. So, you know, if. And that's if, just at the surface. Yeah. If you go an inch down, it's warmer. Uh huh. Fifty-two, probably. Yeah. I think uh -huh. it's if you go a foot or two down, it's like in the seventies because that's the temperature of the springs. There you go. Yep. That's why the tortoises do it. <laughs> yep. 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 So um, helping the citrus tree grab some of that radiant heat from the ground is um, helpful during the cold events. So Jason asks, good morning to everybody. Can you advise of any local native plant nurseries? Big box stores don't seem to have many selections and I'm not sure if they're actually true natives to Florida. Very good skepticism there. <laughs> <laughs> and very uh, true. It's difficult to find a variety of natives at big box stores or even a lot of just run of the mill commercial nurseries. You can find in a big box store muley grass and maybe some dwarf yopon hollies. <laughs> that's about it. I once tried the most depressing scavenger hunt ever. You, that's why I say that you have to be really dedicated to finding native plants because it's not something you're going to get up on a Saturday morning, leisurely have your coffee, and then run out to the big box store to grab. I'm native it's not going to happen you have to make an effort and to know where you're going to go um native ones um nurseries there's not a whole lot of local ones that i can think of i mean one is basically i'm um, working on going out of business <laughs> from someone we know um now the master gardener nursery is not exclusively native but they do have a lot of natives and they have knowledgeable volunteers who will guide you and let you know yes this is native you know no this isn't this is florida friendly it's not native what i would also suggest is you go uh, look up f-a-n-n -N, florida association of native nurseries that's what i was trying to remember and i couldn't remember and they will give you a list of nurseries. It may, you know, it's it's a difficult thing because you may have to go a little bit out of the range here. Groveland area, those, all those places that feed Disney, you know, so they have some big nurseries. 
they actually have, you know, some nice nurseries. So you may have to make a day trip of it, but don't go too far because a native nursery in Miami is not going to have the kind of plants you need here in Central Florida. So try to stay within Central Florida, but you might have to make a fun day trip out of finding them. But also pay attention to like Hernando County Native Plant Society. They'll occasionally have uh, plant sales or let you know where plant sales are. So just really try to get in even online with the native plant groups to find out when and where and how you can get a hold of native plants. And then you start making friends and then you start sharing, <laughs> you know, so that's really the only way I know to do it. And our, our Master Gardener volunteers have a nursery and I have the address up here. It is located right behind the uh, Hernando County Fairgrounds right along 41 for anybody in or around Hernando County. And they're open Wednesday morning and Saturday morning from 8.30 in the morning to 11. During the winter, it's noon, but it's still really hot right now, so they close at 11. And they have it, a it, really it start good... start melting at about 10.30. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But they have a really good selection of native plants. Mm -hmm. They'll have every native plant in the world, but they have a lot more than you find at a big box store or many yeah. other nurseries. And not every plant they have is native, so ask, you know, and be sure. Yeah, but every plant they have is either native or Florida-friendly and no pesticides generally no no um funny thing is all the salvias get mealy bugs in the summer and they have to hit them with insecticidal soap but that's about it mm -hmm. we used to good example is um canna lilies mm -hmm. we don't sell them anymore we used to years ago every summer they get two different species of caterpillars they're leaf rollers and they chew the heck out of the leaves. They're really hard to control. So we just quit carrying cannas. Right. Sometimes if it's too hard, stop doing it. Yeah. If, if you have a plant that's just impossible to control all the problems with it, you may want to reconsider having that plant in your yard and replacing it with something easier to care for. Right. Because there's plenty of things out there that are very, very easy to care for. Mm -hmm. What's that? You say you shouldn't be working harder than your plant does? Yes. If you're if you're working harder than your plant, then that plant is not a Florida friendly plant or it's not the right plant in the right place. Exactly. It may be perfect for Miami or Jacksonville or shady spot or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. You just have it in the wrong spot. So we got a question about a blood lily plant that bloomed. I've left it intact as the stalk is still green. There is a reddish berry on the spent bloom. Suppose it's a seed pod. I do have a photo if you'd like to see it. I can almost guarantee you that is a seed pod because I know amaryllis and many other lilies, if you leave the, the flower on there and you don't cut it off and you let it dry out, they make little seed pods mm -hmm. and they make seeds and the seeds are viable. You could try planting them. Amaryllis aren't lilies. No, but amaryllis is also is a bulb. They're amaryllis ACE, not lily ACE. <laughs> but it's still a bulb. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cr crinum lilies. Mm -hmm. Crinum lilies get pods with seeds, don't they? Um, yeah. I think so, yes. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so save the little seed pod. Let the stalk and the flower completely dry out. Pick off the seed pod and put it in a paper bag in a closet inside and you and go ahead and plant it and you should get another plant from it it should be viable okay. uh, so we got a, boy we're just we're just stacking up the questions here great. today it's fantastic because it's that time of year that's when all the diseases and insects and everything are at their peak oh yes so Lorraine says, I had teeny white flies on my cabbage this year. Tried seven dust, but couldn't keep up with them. They cleaned out my cabbage, concerned about my garden this fall. Is there something I should treat the soil with? Mm, just use Starting different. from the beginning, and there's a whole bunch of points here. Mm -hmm. Teeny little white flies on your cabbage are probably white flies. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a common name for the insect pest. 
if you look online, if you look up University of Florida white flies, there are white flies and they are pests of different various vegetables. If you grew your, I, you don't say when you grew the cabbage, you have to grow cabbage between September and maybe March. By March 15th, that cabbage needs to come out of the ground. Don't grow cabbage after March 15th. If you she's be, in Central Florida. If you're in Central Florida, if you're way up in North Florida, it's a little bit different. If you're in South Florida, you have to get rid of the cabbage even earlier. So you have to grow cabbage the right time of year from, I do it from September or October-ish through March 15th at the latest. Anything after that, you will be overwhelmed with insects and diseases. Nothing I could suggest is going to help you. Seven dust is labeled for white flies and should be effective on white flies, but really all you need to control white flies is insecticidal soap, which is a lot safer for you to apply and use. I mean, you are planning on eating the cabbage, I assume, yeah. so it's safer for putting on something that you're going to eat. What you have to do is keep checking your plants diligently, and the first sign of white flies, you need to be out there with insecticidal soap, and spray and check and spray and check and be on top of it. If you wait until you go out there and you tap the plants and this cloud of little white flies come up, it's probably too late. So early identification, early control is really, really important. If they clean out your cabbage, that's what they do. My guess is your cabbage was growing past March 15th-ish. Mm -hmm. um, Treating your soil is not going to help because the white flies don't live in the soil. They get around. They move from plant to plant. They're, they're feeding on weeds right now. They're in the woods or alongside of the road. When you start planting cabbage this fall, they'll find it. They'll come back. They fly. If they fly very well. They get around. Um, you know, they did research years ago where they took very fine netting and put it on poles and put it way up in the air to find out what is blowing around in the sky above our heads. And they found white flies, they found spider mites, they found a lot of really tiny insects. They're so small that they don't fly, they don't have big wings, they don't fly really well, but they fly enough to get airborne, a breeze will catch them up, they'll go 100 feet in the air and they go, <laughs> they go down the road and across this county to the next county and then all of a sudden they drop down and they land in Lorraine's yard on her cabbage. So that's how they get here. You can't stop that from happening. They do. So they don't fly, but they glide. Yeah, they, they glide. And spider mites don't have wings. Right. But they have that webbing and a spider mite is so small, if he takes a piece of webbing and waves in the air, it's just enough for a breeze to catch. Yeah and get him airborne because they don't weigh hardly anything. And they get caught up in the in the up in the atmosphere, they blow around and they drop out and that's so they're not flying you know, falling with style. Exactly. So <laughs> you might not realize it, but there really are things falling out of the sky all mm -hmm. the time. Don't focus on it too much. It'll drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So Jenny has a citrus tree that she grew from seeds. Now it's about eight years old. That's great. That makes for a great hobby. Uh, it does take a number of years to grow citrus from seeds. So you need to be very, very patient for that. It has black looking stuff on the leaves. What is this and what, and can I save the tree? Any is guess that what that might be? I mean, like edible fruit from a seed? Yeah. Or is it gonna be kind of sour? You, you have no idea because if you're growing it from a seed, it's the genetic role of the dice. It will be citrus. It won't be a watermelon <laughs> and it won't be a uh, papaya. It will be citrus. It may be wonderful tasting citrus. It may be terrible. It may be from the rootstock. There's a lot of different types of citrus it could be. Yes, yeah, so I thought they had to citrus. graft um, citrus together to mm -hmm. you know, have the hardy rootstock and then the you know, the sweet graft is normally what they do. But yeah, you can grow them from seed. 
but I thought they could possibly be sour and like really thorny. Oh, sure, they can be, and mm -hmm. frequently are. So, That's Jenny, what I can when, guarantee you, you're going to get tasty fruit off of it. You will get fruit eventually. Yeah, that's um, what happens when the you know the citrus just falls in an abandoned um, grove or something, and you know people have been in Florida a long time. They just call them wild, wild orange trees, and they um, it, they treat them more like lemons, or they make a uh, marmalade or something out of it. But they're pretty thorny. Mm -hmm. But the black stuff on the leaves, what do you do for that? What that is, it, that's a fungus that's growing on just the surface of the leaf. And that's caused by little insects that feed on your citrus tree. And when they poop, it's a very sticky, sugary substance that mm -hmm. sits on the leaf and a fungus starts to grow in it. So the black stuff is not a huge problem. If you have a lot of it on there, it's going to block the leaf so it can't perform photosynthesis. And it wipes off pretty easily. Um, Insecticidal soap, which is probably what you're going to end up using to control the insect, spraying it off with water, wiping it off, it'll come right off. But you need to look very carefully at the undersides of the leaves to see if you don't have white flies, mealybugs, aphids, or certain scales. Because they all, when they poo, it's very sugary and the, it'll let, land on the leaf below it. And that black fungus will grow on the sugary poo. Sugary poo is also called honeydew. And the black so, stuff is called sooty mold, if you want to look that up, too. And insect excrement is called frass. Yeah. So if you want the technical terminology, <laughs> we can go that direction. I kind of like sugary the more, poo. <laughs> the more understandable, it's insect poo. So. <laughs> So and sure, so that, that's very easy to figure out. You need to take a hard look at the undersides of the leaves and the stems of the tree because you have some kind of insect on there that's pooping on the leaves and that's where the black stuff is coming from. And ants actually like the honeydew, the sugary poo. Yes, they do. And ants like you know, sweet things, at least sweet ants do. And they will uh, farm it. They will provide protection for those mealybugs or whatever is creating that from other predators and um, so that they can keep getting their product <laughs> too. It's, it's an interesting uh, system they've got going on. So if you see ants around there, that's what they're after as well. Yeah, so ants are just an indication of an underlying problem and the black stuff on leaves is the same. And you'll see that black stuff on leaves on, it's very common on camellias. Crepe myrtle, crepe, crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles, thank you. Crepe myrtles. Yes. Gardenias, gardenias get it a lot. So, um, and hibiscus can get it. Mm -hmm. Any plants where you're commonly going to find white flies, mealybugs, certain species of scales, half of them do it, half of them don't. And Especially this time of year, when and we have. Um, we went from May with zero rainfall to now we have, you know, a surplus of rainfall. Um, so it's wet and sticky and humid and just perfect conditions for growing all this, all this stuff. This is a tough time of year for growing a lot of different things out in the garden. And this is a time of year where you really learn who is your low maintenance plants and who is your really high maintenance stuff. But Lee uh, has a comment here. Uh, she has a citrus plant that came up from seed, and the swallowtail loves it, which is great. Mm -hmm. Will it ever fruit? And if so, how long will it take? From seed, it could take 10 years before it goes through the juvenile period and starts to flower and get the very first fruit. And she's leaving it for the butterflies, which is great. Yeah. Think yeah. of it as a component of your butterfly garden. There you go. Yep. And people are blowing up my email also. So yeah. you're very popular. <sighs> I guess so. I'm just a popular guy this week. Um 
Yes, uh, Lorraine mentions she's in Brooksville, so she should plant cabbage in the winter. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was getting down to that. So cabbage, yeah. you, you can buy seeds and start little transplants right now, but you don't want to put them in the garden until cabbage. Um, I wait till October. I aim for October year. 1st before oh, okay. I put this stuff That's in. Good. But yeah, you start the cabbage, plant it October 1st, grow cabbage all winter long, plan on being done with it by March 15th, and you should be good. But this is a picture of the blood lily, and that was the flower. And that's the little fruit. Oh, wow. Or seed capsule, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it. Yeah, there should be actually viable seeds inside of that. Pretty cool. Okay. So it looks like Jason's on the track for going out there and buying some native plants. Jason, if you haven't already, follow our Facebook page because we have a master gardener who's an expert with native plants. And we've been doing much more videos with her. She's going to be writing some blog posts. She's put together fact sheets and lists of native plants that grow in the shade, ones that grow in the sun, different ground covers. So all that we've been putting on our Facebook page. So if you follow us on Facebook, you'll find a lot more information than we used to have about native plants. And also, she's also a member of the Hernando um, chapter of the Native Plant Society. And those are really people you want to hook up with because, you know, then you have um, connections, you have, you know, sure, sure, people who know where to find these things, or they even do little tiny plant shares, I mean. Yeah, this they, big, but yeah. they did a plant share here plant, about a month or so ago. Yeah, plant swap. Plant swap, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then, you know, you, you get to know them and they're like, oh, please come come over and take these cuttings, <laughs> you know. And so, oh, Austin's here this morning. Do you see Cindy? Good morning, Austin. Yeah. Do you see Cindy's question there about, there it is. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm going, I try to go down the line so I don't miss anybody. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll stop pounding you then. <laughs> That's okay. So Cindy says, yesterday I saw something white underneath a leaf and I cut the leaf off. Just a habit from up north. Anything white growing on your plants is never good. Now I'm not sure if I made a mistake. Looks like they're lacewing eggs. Quite fascinating. Hanging down on a silk like thread in a circular pattern. Are they beneficial? I'm not sure where Cindy lives, mm -hmm. how far south of here she does. But what kind of, the only thing that caught my attention there, she says it like a silk like thread in a circular pattern. Green lace wings are a very, very beneficial insect. She Even green in lace wings gobble up aphids and all these mealybugs and all these little pests that are really, really bad in your garden. Lace wings, when they lay their eggs, each egg is separate. It's on a little thread that's attached to a leaf. If you got in your garden and turned over enough leaves, you, you're going to find some. They're very, very common. They're all over Florida, very easy to find the eggs. But each egg has its own little stalk, and those are lace wing eggs. Mm -hmm. If you see little white eggs laid in a circle, or it almost looks like a, when you're putting in an email address, the at, the little kind of, <laughs> what would you call that? A circle that goes inwards. Let me draw it out, Lily. Yeah, okay. It yes. smaller. But it spirals. Okay. If you see eggs in a spiral and they're not on stalks, there are certain species of white flies in South Florida that do that and they're a really bad pest so hmm. so here we go cindy lives in largo she has pictures if you want to shoot me the um sure. photos that'd be great and she says it's in a spiral so i would if they're on a stalk green lacewing very good if they're just on the leaf in a spiral certain invasive species of white fly probably pretty bad oh so it was okay then that she cut that off and threw it away probably 
Sure, that's not going to hurt anything. If they did turn out to be lace wings and you still have the leaf, you may want to just put it back in your garden. Um, if they're white flies, you want to get rid of that leaf, and then you want to keep an eye out because if you see some white flies, there's a lot more sneaking around out there right behind them. Mm -hmm. um, she hasn't thrown it out. Okay. Let me... Let me check my email here. Um, let me close a few things out. Here we go. We got a picture from Louise. And what do you think this is, Lily? It's really hard to see <laughs> coming up through the, the uh, bridge here. Yeah, I can't I can't see it because I have, you know, the whole oh, okay. the whole chat and everything open. Something coming up through bricks. Yeah, that, that makes it a little bit bigger. Yes, I see bigger. something coming up between the bricks. Is it chamber it bigger? Ever Everglades tomato that has reseeded itself. You know, when I first, my first thought was some kind of tomato, but yep. it's hard to see it. Oh, wow. Well, no, that's, that's a baby tomato. And if you grow tomatoes and you let, and this happens especially to cherry tomatoes, you let any of them fall off the plant, let's say a bird pecked at them, caterpillar pecked at them, or chewed on it, it rotted or whatever, you leave it on the ground, you will have baby tomatoes all over the place. Now, should she, you know, I'm sure she wants to pull that up and put it in a pot, maybe. <laughs> it's not going to That's going to be a little tough. Do well there. Yeah, that one's going to be a little tough to get out. Gently pull it up as gently as you can and then repot it, maybe. If it was me, I'd just leave it be, let it go, see how far it goes. Might be interesting. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have too much further to go to start flowering and setting fruit. Of course, having it growing in the middle of your path, you know, might yeah. get in the way a little <laughs> bit, but. Uh, okay, gosh, nothing else in email there. Um, okay, well, um, it is about the time of year, isn't it, to start a fall garden? which would be a warm season garden, not including cabbage, correct? So what what should they do now as far as vegetable gardening? Yes, now is the time to start getting busy putting your fall vegetable garden in. The things that you can start with very, very soon or even technically right now are going to be the warm season vegetables. Things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, green beans, possibly pole beans. Pole beans take longer to grow. They may bump into cold weather season, but bush beans, definitely. Mm -hmm. All those things you can either start from seed and start your little transplants now, plan on putting them out in the garden September-ish, or you can plant uh, the bush beans and things like that directly in your garden. What is this, August 19th? Just about today, pretty much. Sure. Technically, you could grow watermelons, pumpkins, summer squash, winter squash, cucumbers. Also, boy, they are hard to grow this time of year. The diseases and insect pests and caterpillars will overwhelm you quickly. And you, there's a very good chance you'll end up with nothing to show for your time and effort. You can try them because <clears throat> the weather is appropriate for them, but they're really, really tough ones to grow in the fall. Now, very shortly after that is the time of year for broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, anything green and leafy, mm -hmm. lettuce, kale, mustard greens, Swiss chard, uh, any root things, radishes, turnips, beets. Kohlrabi. 
kohlrabi, mm -hmm. um, carrots. Um, what are the ones that look like carrots that they grow up north? You probably ate them in Pennsylvania. <laughs> That look like carrots? Carrots or carrots? What do you mean? No, there's something like carrots. Uh, it'll come to me. <clears throat> Onions, leeks, not rutabagas. Anybody here from Canada really can't grow rutabagas here. It just never gets cold enough. Uh, all those things can start going in October or November or any time after that. So you so, mentioned now, though, I think you said the squashes. So you can do the zucchini and stuff like that now. Yep. You can start them now. They are really hard to grow. They have a lot of disease problems. They have a lot of insect problems. If white flies attack your plants, they carry a lot of viruses that kill all those plants that are in that plant family, cucurbits. So, so then for a zucchini, just rely on your northern relatives who are going to have them by the bushel full. <laughs> just get some from them. Is that what you No, think? zucchini and yellow squash and all the summer squash and cucumbers <clears throat> are a lot easier to grow in the very, very early spring. I'm talking like starting them late February and getting them out there as early as you can. So they like it cool to begin with. So if you're starting now, you're putting them in this swampy air gush mush that <laughs> they don't like. Yes. They don't necessarily like it cool ever. They like it not humid, and they yeah. like it when they're not being jumped on by bugs. Yeah. And the time of year where that happens is the end of February. So you want to get them in early, and you have your best shot of growing them and getting them. So many people try growing them during the heat of summer, and all you have to do is just go to any Florida vegetable gardening Facebook group, and all you see is picture after picture after picture of dead cucumbers, dead tomatoes, dead eggplants, dead mm -hmm. peppers. What's wrong with my cucumber plant? And it's, the problem is you're growing at the wrong time of year. Right. Now is not the time of year to have a mature one of any of those. I had a volunteer cucumber. I told you about it on, in a, on a compost pile. Started up late June, something like that. You know, did pretty good through July. I'm just looking at it. I mean, it flowered, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't believe yeah. you. Yeah, it's dead. <laughs> it's dead now. I didn't yeah. think it was actually going to make it. They can go for a while. Parsnips, that's it. Thank you, Lee. Parsnips <laughs> look like carrots. I'm sure you ate parsnips in Pennsylvania. I was a child. I wouldn't want to eat, you know, I didn't want to eat my vegetables then. <laughs> yeah. Parsnips don't grow in Florida. It, yeah. Even during the winter, it's still a little bit too full. I don't know. You can try them. Mm -hmm. Should I try growing parsnips this winter just to see if I can grow them? If you want to. <clears throat> Lily, I'm sure you can help me with some recipes for them. <laughs> you know, there's this great thing called Google, Bill. <laughs> Very good point. There's great recipes on Google also. Yes. And rutabagas. Have you ever tried rutabagas? I've never even tried them. I think I have, yeah. They're kind of, you know, turnipy. <laughs> like, you yeah. Know. I like turnips, and I've grown before the little small Japanese turnips, and you can get white ones or purple ones. I think they're good. I don't like turnips in general. They're too astringent, you know, for me. Yeah. I've never tried the big traditional white and purple turnips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never tried them. Do you I see Lee is um, discussing her Everglades tomato? Oh, Lee grew parsnips in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm sure they have parsnips in Pennsylvania also. I'm sure they do. So Louise says that Everglades tomato grow in the patio pavers. Not the first time it's happened. She's left them in the pav pavers and they grow poorly as expected. Yeah, because you, it's got rocks on top of the sure. roots, so it's not going to get a whole lot of water or room to grow. Um, sure, if you want to, because looking at that picture, I still have it on my email open here. <clears throat> if you pull up the pavers around it, you could dig it up and transplant it. 
I'd just pull it and see what, what would happen. It's a volunteer anyway. It was free. So. And yeah, Lorraine's have problems with zucchini, butternut squash, cucumber, cucumbers. Oh my gosh, they're so hard to grow. Uh, the leaves rotting. What that is, is any one of a half a dozen different fungal diseases that those plants are very, very prone to getting. And when the weather is humid and warm and it rains a lot and it rains especially late in the day or at night, those diseases get really bad. And right now we're at the peak of those conditions. So those diseases are at their peak right now. Um, so yeah, technically, technically our last average date for a frost or freeze here in Hernando County is late February, February 20 something, I think. Oh no, it's the mid March. Nope. Technically for central Florida, it's late February, but that's the average. Reality. Half of the, <laughs> half of the years you get a freeze after that. Yeah. The other half of the years, you don't. And sometimes we don't. So I'm if going you have March a, 15th. March 15th is safe to put those things out by seed where you're not going to get another frost or freeze. Right. After February 20-something, half the time you won't get another freeze. Okay. Earlier in February, my guess is you almost always get a freeze or frost of some kind. So if you have a way of putting up planting them and keeping them warm on a cold night, that's the way to go. That's going to give you the best chance of actually getting cucumbers. Put them in early, make them grow fast, keep them happy, have them grow, flower, fruit. And then by June 15th, at the very, very, very latest, plan on them being done and gone. After June 15th, don't ask me what to do to help save your cucumbers or yellow squash or tomatoes and stuff because I have no suggestions for you after that. Sorry. Well, the only thing you're growing after that are black eyed peas. Okra. Okra. Okra grows great in the steamy yeah. summer weather. It doesn't mind it at all. Sweet potatoes and various tropical fruits and mm -hmm. vegetables, correct? Yes, the oddball yard long beans and chayote squash things that you would be able to find at a, a specialty um spanish or caribbean uh grocery store or produce stand or something like that and a lot of them are very tasty uh a lot of them can be pretty easy to grow uh lorraine says her eggplant did good this summer eggplants will take more heat but it's a 50 50 shot at the very best that it's going to actually survive summer all the way through sometimes they do and they just quit producing for a little bit in the heat of summer uh but they'll flush back out and give you another crop of eggplants in the fall a lot of times the eggplants peppers and tomatoes just don't survive the summer we have two warm seasons one cool season and most of these edibles take the summer off so really we should do as far as vegetable gardening they're smarter than we are who wants to be out there in this heat so going through the different warm springtime things that you should grow in the vegetable garden any kind of cucumbers yellow squash zucchini all those things they're going to die first they're they're dead by june 1st generally june 15th is when the tomatoes go they'll hang on a little bit longer but now you're wasting a lot of time and money on spraying for caterpillars and fungal leaf spots by june 15th trust me they're on the way out they're taking a dive cherry tomatoes will last a little bit longer cherry tomatoes a little bit longer peppers a little bit longer hot peppers a little bit longer than that hot peppers can survive the summer but not always and eggplants can survive the summer, but not always. Last year, mine died before the end of summer. This year, I have some, and I'm not getting any quality eggplant off of it. So I'm probably going to pull them as soon as in my free time, as soon as I get a chance. <laughs> so Lorraine says, can I keep the plants for fall? I just cut some last week. 
sure, if they're still alive and they're pr and they're doing okay, you can keep them. But like I said, there's a 50-50 chance they're going to survive. A lot of those things, the peppers and eggplants may stop producing for a bit. If you can keep them alive, once we get into September, cools off a little bit, days are shorter, humidity technically drops, doesn't really feel like it much. But okay. you, the plants will recover and flush out and get some new growth on them. You can actually prune them up a little bit if they have any bad looking branches, spotted leaves, trim them off, and they'll flush out again, flower again, and now you'll get a whole second crop of eggplants and or peppers in the fall. They really want the nights to be less than 70 degrees. That's one thing they're looking for to, to be able to um, fully flower. Otherwise, they'll just keep throwing their flowers off. Yeah, that's a good point that it's not always the daytime high, it's the nighttime low. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, and the days technically getting shorter is more important than, because this afternoon, it's going to be really hot outside. Next month, middle of September in the afternoon, it's going to be really hot outside. Middle of October, it's still going to be really hot outside. You may be thinking, it doesn't feel any cooler as we go on. Technically, the days get shorter, the nighttime temperatures get a little bit lower, and that's what has the biggest effect on whether vegetables are going to grow and flower and produce or struggle and maybe survive and flower and the flowers drop off. So with that, I think it's about that time. Boy, it's thanks, good. everybody. That was a real that that was was a very real productive workout there. Meeting. Yes. Now we need to go take naps. <laughs> if only we could, huh? Yeah, if only we could. <laughs> I have to go look at a dead lawn this afternoon. And then I have a late in the afternoon meeting that I think you, you'll probably be on also. Yeah, from and four to five, we have, we have a Zoom meeting, and then six, we start our rain barrel workshop and compost. Yeah, this is going to be a long day. It is. <laughs> that four to five Zoom meeting, I'm going to be driving in, on my phone at that. <laughs> have you done a Zoom meeting on your phone yet? Yeah, one or two, yeah. I, have, I haven't even tried. I need to. Mm -hmm. So if you have any other questions for Lily, there is her email. If you have any other ones for me, there is my email once again. You are always welcome to call our extension office here in Hernando County, or for those of you who live in other parts of the state or other parts of the world, you should contact your own county's uh, extension office. They can be a very valuable resource with identifying insects and plant problems because they're more familiar with what's happening in your county mm -hmm. right now than we are. We know Hernando and surrounding areas of Central Florida, but start getting too far north, like up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, I don't know what's going on up there, or down in Miami. I kind of know what's going on down there, but I'm not the expert. Right. So contact us for local questions or your own extension office. And um, you know, these classes are recorded and you can watch them afterwards on our Facebook page, our Facebook um, private gardening group, our YouTube page, they are saved as a YouTube video, and they are also saved as a podcast. Now, I'm about two or three weeks behind on uploading them to the podcast mm -hmm. platform. Sorry, I'll get caught up on that today. But here's a link if anybody is interested in listening to podcasts, these clinics are saved as a podcast also. So we're posing stars now too. Yay. <laughs> we're trying to make it just as convenient for you as we can so you have no excuse for not listening each and every week. <laughs> and hey guys, with that, Maria, you're very welcome. Lee, thank you for tuning in to the clinic and uh, some of our other classes. We always appreciate that. Uh, Lorraine, you're very welcome. I live in Spring Hill, and Lorraine lives in Brooksville? As she said, Brooksville, yes. Okay. So I am 
in my free time, and I'm trying to spend a little bit of time every afternoon when I get home from work, depending on the weather, although I obviously can't today unless I want to go out with a flashlight taped to my head after dark. But I'm trying to get my vegetable garden up and growing, so I'll be having lots of pictures and tips and tricks start this, this week, cool. wait until next month to do this. I'm going to get a lot of just little short videos, pictures, things like that to share. Mm -hmm. And Cindy, you're very welcome. And Karen, you're very welcome also. So I'm glad to see we have so many new names and uh, maybe people who have been stalking us for a long time and they were just afraid to ask a question. So, could be. <laughs> yes. don't, don't be afraid to ask questions because otherwise we get really lonely here. Yeah. Eventually we run out of stuff to talk about. Exactly. We have to make up stuff to talk about. <laughs> yes. No, we don't make up stuff. We just start talking about right. obscure topics like insect poo. Yeah, always, we, there was a lot of poo discussed today. Yeah, you know, we have an awful lot of episodes where that kind of no, you know, runs through the whole conversation. Especially in the plant world, who happens? So. Exactly. <laughs> and Buddy's on here also from the Panhandle. I was wondering, yeah. Buddy's been quiet today. So, <laughs> so hey, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Uh, we will be back here again next week. And... Um, We'll try to find a special guest for next week. Not sure exactly who. Need to uh, ask somebody, but I got some ideas. So. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Yeah, I, I watched you and Hannah. It, that was great last week. Mm -hmm. Hannah from Chinsigit Conservation Center. So. Hannah was great. We have to have her back on here again. Mm -hmm. She knows more about animals and birds and stuff than I do. Don't ask me bird questions, folks. Okay. I can't help you with that. But hey, everybody, we will see you again next week. Until then, thanks again. Bye. Thank you.